Hey everybody, it's Mark Houston and Andy Young from my first podcast. And today is it my first podcast or no, my first? Let's concert? try that again. No, let's let's keep it uh, rolling. Keep that I, I want to keep it. Yeah. Damn it! Why does every mistake I make you want to leave in the intro? Because it's just. I don't know. feels we, good to you somehow, want, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. I, I want people to see that you're a human <laughs> and not uh, this radio deity. All right. My first concert is, is what we're doing this week, and, and we're finally getting into the realm of real music. On this uh, on this show, Andy has 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 run it through the rock filter this entire time, and I'm ready for a little country. Can have we do it really? that? I, 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 I think so. Guests, you know, a lot of them have been rock, but they all have been. All the, all of them. The only one that uh, you know was kind of on my side a little bit was uh, Craig from uh, the Monument oh, because sure. they they do the country shows. So it's about well, my turn. I mean, Doctor Schaefer was kind of a he wore he wore a lot of hats. That's 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 true, but not 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 country enough. The the cowboy hat he wore wasn't big enough. Okay. okay? So today we're finally talking with somebody in my area of expertise. Sure. John Shaw is his name. Uh, he's a producer. He's a session musician. He's a touring musician. Uh, everybody from Jason Aldean to Ronnie Millsap. But he got his roots with the Delta Saints of all bands. How about that? I still have to are go they, listen now to what, those guys. Are they a country? What are they? I, I don't know. You just introduced me oh, to okay. them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Did you, we just had this conversation okay. before the I'm intro. Sorry. All right. Uh, John Shaw, welcome to my first concert. Good to meet you as well, Mark. Uh, I'm the the director of programming up here uh, for all of our radio stations. I've been, I, I told Andy, I said before we started, I said it's finally nice that we're getting somebody on here that's going to talk about real damn music. I've been a country programmer for 31 years, <laughs> and I'm sick of talking this rock <laughs> bullshit. I want to talk country music a little bit. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Man, it's cold. That, sound, that sounds good to me. Good. You know, good. I was thinking you two have probably been in the same room together and not known it because you've been on tour with a bunch of acts. That, you've probably been through Rapid before, haven't you? Uh, yeah, qu quite a bit. Um, and you know, and on. I, I mean, we may have met years ago, like when I was on a radio tour with somebody too. You know, so. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure we probably have. Yeah. It is. It's crazy how small. I mean, really, the the you know the world can be, especially when it comes to country music. It's I'm I'm I've always that's what drew me to the whole thing was just that uh, that intimacy that it brings. I think more than almost any other form of music. I think that's true. I think you know there's a vulnerability in an honest song, and and when and both as a listener and a creator, you know, there's a vulnerability there. And when a when somebody really gets into a song, it's because in country, it's because it speaks to them, uh, and it speaks to their life story, and and people bond over that, and then they share it. Well, joining us on this podcast right now is is John Shaw, a guitar player. You're a songwriter. You're a producer, and your 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 stable uh, that you have played with is is impressive as hell. When Andy sent me over the the, the email. I'm looking at the list, you know, looking at Brad Paisley and Jason Aldean and Ronnie Millsap and Laney Wilson and Mo Pitney. And I mean, this just goes on and on and on. And that's amazing, man. That's an impressive list of people that you've got a chance to work with. Oh, man, it's been I've been super fortunate. I've been I've been really blessed since I've been here in town, you know, and and everything from, you know, really long stints. Like uh, I was, you know, I was with Josh Turner for seven years. Um to, you know, some of those are, are really cool. Uh, you know, we do a lot of benefits and, and house band things here in Nashville where somebody like, you know, you might play with, with Laney and, you know, Haley Witters and uh, Chris Young on three consecutive songs in the same night, which is totally wild and, and super fun. So, uh, yeah, I, I've been really blessed to, to play with a lot of great folks, you know, either either working directly for them or, or in some cool circumstance I get thrown into where I uh, I get to make music with people that are just otherworldly amazing. So, Well, let's talk a little bit about your 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 background then, John. Um, you uh, were born and raised in Alabama. I was I was born and raised mostly in Alabama. Um, we moved uh, we moved up to Pennsylvania when I was 13 and then over jogged over to Wisconsin when I was 16. And then I came down to Nashville, uh, when I was 18, uh, and 
did the whole Belmont thing and off to the races since that's, then. Been here ever since. So. That's that's amazing. Going from um, you know a southern background to an east coast background to a Midwest background. Um, I, I could see where maybe some of the, that, that, that love of, of, of country could maybe come from. Sure. Um, it, it's funny, you know, the, the country scene, as you know, in the Midwest is amazing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would say, you know, having lived all three of those regions, like I almost think there's more of a fever for it there than there is even in the South. Uh, kind of where it's, you know, quote unquote from just because it's just good working class people, farming people, you know, and and uh, they love to go to show on the weekends, you know, and it, it's just a it's a nice little environment, you know, and, and every time we go, you know, every time I go to the Midwest on tour, you know, so there's a there's always just ravenous, rabid fans there. They're always hungry to hear good music and and uh, it's great. So. Did you hear that, Andy? He said they're always hungry to hear good music. Yeah, so I that's. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I like all kinds of music. I, I'm not hearts in country, but I do. I do like all kinds of music for sure. Well, I got to bust Andy a little bit. I mean, he's obviously, you know, uh, Andy with with Judd, who's, you know, you're, you're an incredible guitar player. You're you're you have been influenced by, I'm assuming, all kinds of artists as Absolutely. well. You're not just. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, there's tons of country influence in like what we're doing in, in mm -hmm. my playing for sure. Just because that's where all the players are, you know. Mm -hmm. Just ton, just tons and tons. Like John, I mean, <laughs> just a beast. <laughs> so, so <laughs> do you have a is is your is your we'll family kind of musically oriented, John? Is that where you you kind of picked up on some of this, or how, you know, how where did you discover that? Man, man I love this. It's such a it's such an interesting path because. Um, so my mom plays piano and sings, uh, and she's fantastic. She, uh, you know, she played in church a lot. She never, she never really made a career out of it, but she could have. Um, and, uh, so I was, I guess I was around that growing up a lot and, um, and then just exposed to, my dad wasn't musical, but he had great musical taste. So there were always good records around. There was, you know, everything from, you know, old bluegrass, Flatten and Scruggs to uh, the Beach Boys with all those great harmonies. And that's kind of where I got my ear for that. And and to this day, I love putting big, lush vocal harmonies on a record because of that influence. Um, and I I didn't really I kind of resisted the, hey, you're going to play an instrument thing for a long time. And when I was in eighth grade, I had to learn guitar for a music appreciation class. And it just kind of bit me in a, you know, in a lasting way where I, I wanted to stick with it. And at that point, uh, my uncle, who I just always knew he played guitar. I didn't know anything about guitars, but I just knew he had this room in his house that was full of them. Um, and I came down here uh, to Nashville on spring break, and he, he lives about an hour away in Huntsville, Alabama. And he came and picked me up, and he just started throwing the book at me. Like, this is what these guitars sound like. This is a difference in a Telecaster and a Strat and a Les Paul. This is what these amps sound like. And by the way, here's all these records you should be listening to <laughs> and trying to learn. <laughs> and it was just like a crash course in, and he, he kind of never quit until I got to a certain point and he was like, okay, I think he, I can let him figure it know, out now from here. Find his next. <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I've got him to thank in a lot of ways for like really laying the brickwork, you know, as far as my influences and everything. Um, and then I had a really, I had a really good friend in high school in Pennsylvania when we moved up there that he was just a few years ahead of me and he was listening to all the same stuff. And it was one of those, like, you know, we're going to jam and he's going to kick my butt and then kind of show me how he did it, you know, oh, nice. <laughs> kind of yeah. things. And I've just had a series of good mentors, man. And, and, and it just kind of kept the fire lit long enough that I, I parlayed it into some sort of a career. And, uh, as long as I can keep fooling everybody that I know <laughs> what I'm doing, I, uh, <laughs> I think that's uh, I think that's the majority of the industry. In that's, that's what we're all doing, I think. <laughs> so, so John, do you remember do you remember that first moment you uh went into a studio or you you what what did, did did you tour first or did you were you were, were you a studio musician first? Um that's complicated. I was actually in a rock band first. Um Oh wow. Band, the tables have uh, turned, Houston. 
<laughs> yeah. I, <laughs> well, you know what? That band probably would have done a lot better if we'd have tried to be a country band. Uh, and just in terms of like the way it sounded, uh, like it was very rootsy. It kind of sounded like uh, like Blackberry Smoke. Kind of, it was sure. that kind of a vibe. Mm-hmm. Uh, so like it was like right on the edge of that Americana country, you know, dirty blues rock thing. It was a really, it was a wonderful band. I, I was really fortunate to be asked to be a part of it. And I was in that band uh, kind of through college and I was doing some live stuff and some studio stuff. I went, I went to school at Belmont and, and there's a, you know, pretty robust recording program there that that's kind of what I was a part of. And uh, so we were in the studio a lot and I was kind of, you know, learning a lot of what not to do (laughs) (laughs) Um, there. But um, in terms of just it being a safe place for me to make all my mistakes that would have gotten me blacklisted. Um, <laughs> but uh, but I, uh, I got in this band, the Delta Saints there, um, and we made a record with uh, our buddy Jay Hall, who Andy knows very well. Um, and then that was that i guess that was kind of the first time i'd done a record not with like fellow students it's the first time i'd been exposed mm-hmm. to like that level of intensity and professionalism were those guys and all Jay belmont and guys too or? All... they were they were uh, all the saints guys were uh were belmont along alongside me and so we made a record my it, it ended up being my senior year at belmont that we made this the cp and with jay and at that point like jay and i just kind of hit it off and we he started having me play on other records um but i was actively touring with the saints full time as well so it was kind of the the answer to your question is kind of both and then it's been that way ever since where like i've always i've always kind of had something going on studio wise uh, like I've always, I've always just kind of interplayed back and forth between sometimes I'm busy on the road, sometimes I'm busy here and it just always seems to work out. So I've, it's, it's always been 50, 50, 70, 30, 60, 40, whatever, you know, whatever mm-hmm. the mix is at any given time. So who was your, who was that moment, that first nervous moment for you, uh, when you were like, Oh, oh my God, this is who I'm going to be playing with. Oh my gosh. Uh, all of them. <laughs> um, the uh, I, I've had a few, you know. I tend to, uh, I tend to. I guess the first one that really like freaked me out, as as far as like the stature of someone that I looked up to growing up, was actually when I was still at Belmont. Um, they do these things, and it's a per genre thing that they they call showcases, and it's not like a label showcase. It's like internal to Belmont. And it's basically a competition uh, of like, and they'll do rock showcase, country showcase, CCM showcase, blah, blah, blah. And then the winners of that, all those showcases do one at the end of the year called best of the best. And the saints won rock showcase. So like we're, we go do best of the best and we were closing out the night because rock showcase just does that. It didn't have, it wasn't merit based. It's just rock showcase was planning on closing out the night and they were honoring Vince Gill that night. And because uh, he's he's pretty involved at Belmont, and I just I worship that guy growing up, man. Like he's on any given day, he's probably my favorite country guitar player, and also has this like golden voice and amazing songs. Right. And uh, so Vince is on the bill, and they're honoring him, and he's going to play a song right before we go on. And I was like protesting. I was like, I can't do it. I can't go on after. I can't follow Vince Gill. I can't do it. Don't make me. Um, and then I had a, you know, there's been a few others. I, I also really grew up uh, kind of semi obsessed with Brad Paisley. And he was, he kind of had a lot to do with the fact that I ended up in, in Nashville. Uh, I read this guitar player, vintage guitar or something interview one time. And he talked about Belmont and I had no clue what I wanted to do. I didn't want to go to college, but he talked about, you know, the recording program and the fact that they're just giving you free studio time and major studios, you know, so you can go figure it out basically. <laughs> and I thought, well, now that sounds like a good time that, that I could do, you know, and 
And uh, so I just always looked up to him and, and what he did and what he represented. And uh, I was playing with, a, with an artist named Kristen Kelly, who was touring with Brad in 2012. And he threw this like mid tour party one time and he and I ended up nerding out on cigars which turned into nerding out on gear, which turned into like, he invited me to sound check to like demo some of his gear. I'm like freaking out. Cause I'm like, <laughs> this is this dude, you know? And, and then he like lays on me. He's like, uh, Hey, I'm going to go sit in your box, sit in with your boss today. Like, yeah, I'm going to play, you know, I want to play a couple songs during her set. So he ended up playing with us that night. Cause he does that, you know, it's kind of a good, you know, goodwill thing. Right. Like, uh, and to have, and he just loves to play guitar. So, and so I remember going back to Kristen's bus and, and saying, Hey boss, like you're, you're either going to love me or kill me for what I just, what just happened. But you know, Brad's sitting in tonight and you know, of course she was overjoyed, overjoyed. But then I'm thinking, Oh, well, you know, now, I'm, now I have to walk on stage with Brad. I'm just like, I'm going to give him as much room to be Brad Paisley as oh, I yeah. can. I'm just going to sit and play rhythm and smile you know so speaking of that i've you know i a lot of people that listen to the radio and have their favorite artists you know vince gill brad paisley i keith urban i think would be another one thrown in there they don't truly realize what incredible guitar players uh these artists are do you have um do you have like like singer singer guitar player favorites i mean who would you like top three who would you put out there like artists that play yeah right country artists that Mm -hmm. play yeah um, you know, I'd say Vince is still the top for me, uh, in that regard, um, kind of a, you know, a different, he's not really straight ahead country, not even country at all, really he comes out of rock world, but the guy that I think just always plays the perfect thing and is also a great artist in his own right is Mark Knopfler. Oh, uh, of course. Dire Straits, uh, you know, and his, that record he made with Emmylou Harris, the, all the road running is just, it may be close to perfect. I, th- wow. I think it might be the, the perfect record. He's kind of like the quintessential uh, like strat player that inspires all strat players, you know, like John Mayer is trying to be Mark Knopfler that's, right that's now, right. you know? Sure. And, and I love John Mayer too. Uh, that one's kind of obvious, like everybody I, who doesn't, but, um, and then, you know, Hunter Hayes is great. Uh, Hunter's a great player. Uh, but if I had to pick a third one, I have to go with Charlie Worsham. Oh, wow. He might be he might be my favorite, you know, young artist that does all of his own guitar heavy lifting. Um I I just think, you know, I think the world of him, I think everything he does is just musically super valid and super cool. Uh that last EP he put out the sugarcane thing with uh, you know, Jay Joyce produced and everything Jay touches turns to gold in my opinion you know the little big town stuff and the ashley mm-hmm. mcbride and uh so yeah that that uh i, I love charlie i, I just I, I think the world of him well all right That's i want to awesome. i want to ask a, a stupid question all right you'd think for as long as i've been in this business i would know the answers to some of these things but now that i have somebody that's that's on this side of it to ask this so <clears throat> i felt so stupid when i i mean let's 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 just preface this by saying that you know this was decades ago so it's not like super recent uh so you've gotten a lot smarter is what you're trying <laughs> yeah, to that's what i'm trying to say okay. right yes sure uh you know a lot of people don't understand that when they go out on tour and see a band playing in a lot of instances outside of the lead singer that band is not the, the band in the studio that's making the actual albums in 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 in, sure. in a lot of cases and i've that that blew my mind when i thought well wait a minute you you mean you weren't playing that? No, you know the session musician plays, and we go out on the road. We're the band, and then we do it. Is is uh, right? Is that is that? I don't know what the question is. Maybe I just wanted to show my ignorance in this podcast once again uh, that I wasn't quite sure. Uh, but that's just that's very interesting to me. And why why don't uh, in some instances or you know whatever the the percentage is why why doesn't the band play in the studio too? Well, think about the lifestyles, first of well, all. Like, the, There's a total different lifestyle between being a studio guy and then being a road dog that's... Well, and John, you know you're I mean? on both ends of it, yeah. though. You're a tour and a studio guy, so you have to have some insight into that. Sh- sure, it, sure. So it mainly, you know, I would say that it has the most to do with the fact that, uh, per, like, scenes are, are... There's little, like, micro scenes within 
the general Nashville music scene. And um, people just kind of find their people. And you always want to use, like, when I'm producing a record, I always want to use the same five guys on it. Uh, and they're verse, and some, you know, I might have two drummers that I'll use. And if it needs to be more vintage rock vibes, I'll use this guy. And if it needs to be more pop oriented, you know, I'll use this guy. But for the most part, you want to hire people that you that are known to you and that maybe you came up with in a different context before you're making records uh, and you really trust because time is money and studio time is expensive. And in Nashville, we tend to work pretty fast. Um, you know, an older an older record that, you know, is like L.A. based, say like, you know, think of a masterpiece record like Hotel California. I think the production schedule was like 71 weeks on that record. <laughs> you know, they spent a year and a half on it. Um, and in Nashville, we make records, you know, in a week. You know, we make EPs in a day and a half. Uh, you know, you do. And that's that's kind of taking time. I, I tend to be on the on the more methodical side of things where I like to spend time and make things you know, flesh things out in a more than first instincts kind of way. But a lot of the sessions I play on, you know, we're cutting five songs in a three hour session and they're done. Uh, so you've got to know that your guys that you hire can pull that off, you know, and whatever your schedule is. So it's a lot of the fact that like, so, you know, say I worked for Josh Turner for a long time. Uh, he, at most of the time that I worked for him, he was using Frank Rogers to produce his records. who did all the Paisley stuff, all the Darius stuff too. And Frank's just got a, a bevy of guys that he trusts and loves and he, he knows can pull that vibe off. You know, it's it was Brent Rowan and JT Cornfloss on electric, Brian Sutton on acoustic, uh, Aubrey Haney played most of the fiddle, uh, Jeff King played some of the electric and baritone, uh, Shannon Forrest on drums, uh, and Kevin Grant on bass. And he just he was using that crew all the time. And are, are, those, him. are um, those the guys that go out on tour with him then too? No, so like I, the band was, you know, I was playing all those JT Cornfloss parts oh, live, okay. uh, which was great for me because I got to really dig in and learn them, you know, not just note for note, but like all the texture of it and everything. Mm -hmm. It's a great learning experience. But uh, in other cases, like I'll, I've played on artist records that, you know, I've never toured with. I, I was on a Ronnie Millsap record a few years ago and I, I never toured with Ronnie, you know, I just... I got in with the guy that was producing it. Um, you know, we worked on some other stuff and then he trusted me to be on the record. So I'd say it mostly has to do with that trust of, you know, the producer that that artist chooses to use or their label picks for them or whatever. They're just going to have their guys. Sometimes I'm one of the guys for artists that never, I never play with live. And, and sometimes I play with artists live that I'm not one of the guys for the studio. So, well, and that's is Okay. Here's another interesting, this, so you, the the studio session the, those musicians they're playing uh and 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 that's the song that everybody hears when it comes on the radio and then you go out on tour with this sure. artist you mm -hmm. but 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 is there ever that moment where you're like okay i'm playing what these guys in the studio play this is what's on the album but do you ever get to add your sure. own flair to it you know it just depends on the gig um you know i went um uh... I played with Ashley Monroe for a couple of years. Well, for a couple of tours, it was two tours in non-consecutive years. Uh, she was, it was album promotion. And, you know, Ashley always wanted me to play. It wanted, wanted it to be recognizable, but my take on it. Oh, okay. Uh, and I've gone and subbed with Ashley, with Ashley McBride. And that's kind of the same vibe. And, uh, the artist I play with now, Sarah Evans, she uh, there are very signature things that she wants to hear about the record, and then there are moments in like transitions or or other you know moments where it's not as signature where you know she does kind of allow a little bit more uh, leeway. So some of it's note for note and some of it's not. Um, and then you know when I was with Josh Turner, it was note for note. Uh, it, he exactly liked the record in at every juncture. That's just what he wanted to hear. So I think it boils down to what your boss wants. Uh, so there are moments you know, where, with, with where the vibe they create. I'm sorry. Uh, there there are moments when you're in the studio and you've you've you're you're the first to play on the song. You're 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 kind of you know the one. Right. Um, and then there are moments when you're just you're you're repeating what other people uh, have already put together. Do you do you do you have a preference for which one you you enjoy more? Which way it goes? 
I, that's what I was just about to say. I said I think there's validity to both approaches. You know, I think I think if I, I love creating and I love being in the studio and making records, and I love whatever level of improvisation is is encouraged in a live setting too. Um, I do think that there's a lot of uh, validity to at least making, you know, some parts are so signature on a record. And as a, as a guy that plays on records, if I'm really proud of a sig lick, like I would hope that it sticks around in the live version. Right. You know, if I'm proud of an intro or an outro or sometimes even a solo, uh, I would really hope that, you know, there's some attempt to recreate that if it's great. Um, and then at the same time, you know, I, I think there's a, I think there's a validity to trust in your players and 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 letting them have some semblance of being able to play themselves but ultimately it's all about the audience for the boss and for us you know if you're playing on a live gig uh you've got to assume your boss knows their audience and what they want to hear and what's going to get be the best show for them and your job, you're in the service business. Even in the studio, you're in the service business. Uh, your job is always to make that artist comfortable and make them be able to do the best show they can. So I so come, I come from like the I'm rock supporting world. An artist live. I was like, go ahead, go ahead. There's a little bit of leg there. Sorry. Go no. Well, oh no, it's all good. I was just gonna say, if, if I'm supporting an artist live, I just I I'm I'm there to do a job. I'm there to to I'm having fun. No matter if it's play the record or not, uh, I'm having fun. But my my job is to make them happy, and and that can be said in the studio too. You know, sometimes sometimes the hundred note solo is not the thing. Sometimes <laughs> they just want you to play the melody, and sometimes that's exactly the right thing to do. For sure. So, so I was saying that like I come from the rock world where it's like I'm in a rock band, so what I'm putting down in the studio, I'm also going to be playing live. You know what I mean? And Sure. I, ha I have this moment and I was wondering if you have the same moment, you know, if you're recording something in the studio is where I put something down in the studio where I'm like real comfortable and like there's no distractions or elements and I'll record something and I'll listen back and I'm like, fuck, I got to do that live every night. <laughs> you know what I mean? I got to pull that off. <laughs> yeah. So do you, do you ever, do you ever put something um, down where you're just like, oh God, whoever has to play this every night is not going to be happy. <laughs> Well, man, I, you know, at, that tends to happen a lot with, with Jay, actually, because yeah. he, and Andy, you'll be able to speak to this, like, uh, there's sometimes, you know, there's a lot of times when I'm on a session where I feel the need to, you know, you don't want to hold every, everybody up, you don't want to sit there and go down a rabbit hole on a part, um, so, like, you're not phoning it in, but you're, you're playing something that's a little on the safe side, mm -hmm. uh, just because of the pace or whatever. And then there's times where you are comfortable and you've been made to feel that way and you're, you're encouraged to maybe go down that rabbit hole and you end up, and Jay's just a pro at that. Uh, I, I try to foster that in myself as a producer and Jay's the, maybe the best I've ever seen. Uh, but that ability to like make you so comfortable that you might play something that's like above and, your, and beyond your ability. Like you didn't know you it. could do, um, yeah, until until the opportunity was there. That's happened to me a million times with Jay where I've like been on the drive home listening to like a rough bounce of something we just did and been like, I didn't know I could do that. <laughs> yeah, it's like where did that influence yeah. even come from? Like you, it doesn't sound like anything that you've listened to before that's influenced you to play like that. That's that's right. And so you just end up with, I think it's just a comfort and confidence thing. Mm -hmm. And, and you end up in that situation where you just feel great. And so you can just play whatever. And ultimately that's where you want to be every time you're recording if possible. Uh, and that's kind of the headspace I try to put myself in. But I did, I remember, uh, you know, when we were working on Brian Lowry's record, uh, you know, doing a lot of, a lot of stuff that was just like, we were on a very like I wasn't putting necessarily a stylistic personality to any particular guitar part. It was just whatever served the song the best, which is ultimately that's the job, right? Um, but like it ended up being B bender on one song and slide on another right. and then like flat pick acoustic on one. And so it was like, well, you know, eventually you're gonna have to hire a guy that can do all that <laughs> stuff. Right. Uh, which they exist. 
they exist, but you know, and then, you know, Jay and I, sometimes we, uh, we kind of take a little pride in, and I, I do this on my own too, on my productions, but there's always a little bit of pride in kind of creating a guitar part that can't sometimes can't physically be played mm-hmm. either because it's a screwed up tuning or, uh, you know, it's two parts that sound like one or four parts that sound like one. We've got so uh, many of those on the record. Where Jay will just st- stack octaves and octaves and octaves on top of each other. And it's just like, that's a gigantic sound that one guitar player cannot make, <laughs> you know? Right. And I, I tend sometimes to like, I, a lot of times when I'm creating a part on a record, you know, it's a melody in my, if it's, especially if it's a signature thing, it's oftentimes a melody in my head first before I don't just sit there and, you know, guitar vomit. Um, and sometimes that's like, well, I need to drop my high E to a D and then I need to raise my G string to an A. And you just, it works in the context of playing. And then it's capo too. So it's like, it works in the context of playing a part, but good luck reproducing it. Cause like that tuning is not, even practical like, <laughs> right <laughs> other than that one, gonna, other than that one gonna... chord voicing that that's the only time you want to use it <laughs> yeah that's right yeah so that's always fun that's always the uh stump stump the hoover has, has to learn this moment <laughs> <laughs> well john uh the you know the kind of the whole point of this podcast for annie and i was to 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 talk to all of these people from all kinds of different musical backgrounds you know from educators to to uh, mm-hmm. to, to people like you to um people that run you know event centers and the the interesting question for me is always that moment when you realized that first song that first concert that moment where you stood there and you were like yep this is it this is what i want to do do you have a defining moment like that john i I kind of do, and you're not going to like that it's not a country song, but uh, country moment. I've, I've uh, been full of country, right? But, I'm so happy, John, I can't stand it. So go ahead. <laughs> I uh, I actually went to go see, you know, my my first my first actual concert was back in the day. My first several, actually, were uh, Tracy Lawrence. Um, but I wasn't playing an instrument at that time, and uh, I just... I I enjoyed it. For some reason, it just clicked. You know, my dad liked country music, so I was exposed to a lot of it, and something about what he was doing just really, you know, took a hold with me. But I was actually, I'd gone to see, uh, with my parents, I'd gone to see uh, Styx, Ario Speedwagon, and Journey. It was this triple bill show they were doing. And there was something about, uh dave amato the guitar player for reo there was just something about it like the tones the guitars that he was using everything just it just worked you know he's playing a lot of slide and i I was really into the allman brothers at the time and uh so that was kind of clicking all of it all of it was just clicking with me and and the music and uh he had these big stacks of marshals behind him and i was like that's awesome (laughs) yep (laughs) and uh and uh, I just, for some reason, it just, it just clicked. And then I, I kind of got to uh, researching him as a, like, as a person and his history as a player and kind of how, because he's not the original guitar player in that band. It was a guy named Gary Richrath uh, originally. And uh, kind of how he got that gig uh, was they, they kind of got in a bind. I think he was, I want to say he was playing with like White Snake or Ted Nugent or something like that at the time. <laughs> And they got in a bind and needed a guitar player, and he like flew out and had all the material perfect on the first gig and all this stuff. And I was like, man, that's cool. Like you got to be a you got to be Billy Badass to do that, you right? Know? And uh, and I thought, man, that's that's awesome. Like I wonder, you know, that sounds like a fun career is like being the guy that like people can just always count on. And uh, and then it there were there were a ton of influence. You mentioned music educators and like my teachers had a lot to do with pushing me kind of over the edge because you know my parents were very supportive but they were my parents i think they would have supported me if i wanted to you know be a archaeologist or a sure. you know right. fireman or whatever <laughs> you know um they so you kind of like i was kind of always looking for that voice that was objective to tell me hey i could do this and I had a couple of teachers, David Winkler and, and Bill Hill in Wisconsin that did. They just kind of shoved me out of the nest and let me 
you know, believe that I could do anything. But I just always had that, the thing about the Dave Amato thing just stuck. Like I always had that working man's mentality of like, the best version of this in my book is going and being the guy people can count on to go nail it. And to this day, you know, I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a regular gig at any given time and, and doing session stuff. But like one of my favorite calls to get, and I, I do this quite a bit is, Hey, you know, our guitar player is whatever, you know, sick or it's been happening a lot with the whole COVID thing. You know, um, we need, you know, we need to got to hop on the bus tonight and do this 90 minute show tomorrow. And I, I love doing that work because I think it traces back to my original like research on Dave. Yeah. And, it's like, you're, you're out, the like, guy. That's how he got the gig. That's how, I, you know, that was my first gig with Josh was, was unrehearsed. Uh, they'd been through a lot of guys. They let, they let a guy go, you know, can you be on the bus next week? And then the next thing I know, it's like, Hey, you passed the audition. <laughs> well, I didn't know it was an audition. Yeah. <laughs> um, awesome. It's, it's, so, a, it's interesting to think uh, that there are, that there are, you know, blue collar musicians out there, uh, you know, that, that you, 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 I mean, to me, that, that seems like a great description for what you do. I've always considered this a blue collar job, um, you know, from both the live and the, and the recording side of it, because, you know, ultimately I'm in the service business. Um, I've, I've got to, like I said, it doesn't, there's not a whole lot of difference between playing between the ethos of hey we're playing this live gig this is what the boss wants versus you're playing on this record this is what the bosses want you just have more bosses because <laughs> usually there's a producer and an artist kind of they both have a you know the artist is going to have a vision for the song and and the producer is going to have a vision for the song and in an ideal world it's the same vision but like andy you know full well sometimes it's not right uh right. You know, sometimes you go in, you go in with two different ideas and sometimes they merge and sometimes you pick one. Um, but it's all, it's all in the context of, of making somebody, somebody else's uh, show or record the best it can be. And the second you come into it with ego or like you're the artiste, uh, then you got problems. You know, you're going to have problems, especially in Nashville. So I, I've always considered a very blue collar, like service oriented profession. And, and I, that's kind of what I love about it. That's awesome. Uh, John, if, if you're ever through here again, I mean, I hope you are at some point with one of these artists, uh, you know, playing up here, we got to sit sure. down and, and go have a whiskey somewhere and, and uh, continue this. Cause this is, I love lot of fun. that Mark. Absolutely. <laughs> we, got, we got a cigar yeah, shop right down the street too. We do. Yeah. We've, we're, we're surrounded by whiskey uh, and cigars. You, now you're speaking my language. <laughs> yeah. John, like this it. is, this has been a lot of fun talking to you, man. I really appreciate this. Uh, you know, and, uh, well, thanks so much for having me guys. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, of course. Next time I'm uh, down, down your way too, we'll, we'll have to hook up. Give me a holler, man. We'll you got do. my number. Let's do it. Absolutely. Thank you, John. Right on. Thanks, Thanks so much, guys. Appreciate you.